Welcome to Carly Gardner, who is a seasoned veteran of the industry. As someone who has worked in strategy, broking, trading, featured in national magazines and co-hosted television shows, it's pretty safe to say that Carly has seen it, smelt it and dealt it. Having worked for big names such as PGF Best and the Zana Group in her time, she has gone on to launch the Dakali Trading Group, her very own brokerage. Carly, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, good to finally catch up with you. I know we've had a bit of problems actually coordinating our diaries. Um, Now, you've had a very active career, having worked as a commodity market strategist and also an options broker, and you have gone on to co-host CNBC's Mad Money program, not to mention your four books. So (laughs) why do you think the industry is so underrepresented with women today? Uh, honestly, I, that is a fabulous question. I've honestly found that uh, I think being a female in this industry has helped me more than it's hurt me. I, everybody that I've ever worked with has embraced uh, anything that I had to contribute. So, I mean, I've had a great time. I, I have no complaints. I, I, I don't know. Um, perhaps other women just never uh, put that, you know, put their foot in the door. It's hard to say. I, I really, uh, I wish they would, though. I think that. There's, there's obviously some, um, you know, you hear things about the mentality. Basically, trading is a mental game, and you hear all these things about maybe women are more mentally stable than men. I'm not sure that that's the case, but I do think that there, there is something to be said about uh, having the um, a risk-averse mindset in this business. And I think, um, not to say that men can't have that mindset but I think women are more more prone to be risk averse just naturally than than men so I do think it's a a place that women could possibly excel if they really gave it a shot but for whatever reason I I, you know women are slow to uh to step into the ring well certainly um popular culture does represent the industry like you look at um uh, Wall Street and the Wolf of Wall Street those kind of like films which really do show the industry to be full of kind of um hubristic men who love the high life and it could possibly be quite intimidating to someone not just um a lady but someone who might be introverted in their personality or might just prefer a quieter life but i think it might be fair (laughs) that these stereotypes don't exist necessarily in real life and it's not the ubiquitous across the industry absolutely i mean those types of things those stories sell and so that's what uh, you tend to see more often than not is because those are interesting and exciting stories maybe not positive stories but those types of things are um so I, I don't think the industry is quite what the media sometimes portrays in fact i don't think it's anything like that but you're right i think that there is that perception out there and uh so maybe it does deter some females from getting involved but it shouldn't i wish that they'd all um you know at least consider it no i think you're right i think hollywood has a, a real kind of knack of um showing various kind of uh, categorical imperatives be roast into spectacles and they just love to sell the sizzle and maybe not the sausage um, exactly right but I mean uh, Dr Alexander Elder I'm not sure if you've heard of the guy he actually wrote this uh, book called Coming to My Trading Room and he conducted a lot of research and the conclusion uh, is or was that women actually do make better traders than men <laughs> would you agree with this I know <laughs> the answer may be not be the most objective one <laughs> sure right I don't I mean I don't want to make a blank statement but like that I, I do think in I can I can speak from personal experience um, that I do think that the um, more common characteristics of women can work both in favor and against it. Like, for example, in my own experiences, I I tend to be, for example, I tend to take profits too early. Sometimes I hedge way too well, you know, so there's, there's a fine line. And of course, not all women have the stereotypical characteristics and all men don't either. So, I I mean, it's not like it's black and white by any means, but um, I do think, think that uh, that women probably tend to be a little, well actually I'm, I'm gonna retract that statement I was gonna say women tend to be a little more uh, emotionally stable but that might not necessarily be true <laughs> all the time so I really think it's honestly I think it's not so much of a gender thing as just a, a individual personality thing um, that's my opinion Okay, well, that's an interesting um, way of looking at it. I mean, certainly from my experience of working on trading floors in London, I mean, I can certainly say that I noticed a certain characteristic amongst, um, well, (laughs) predominantly the men I was working with. Um, Surprise, surprise, there weren't that many women. I think there are actually about two women on the trading floor. But that said, I noticed amongst my co-workers um, in that era of my life that the loudest person in the room 
was often the weakest, and the quietest was often the one who was, say, quietly confident in his ability. Yeah, I, I think I've found that to be absolutely true. Uh, generally, the the people that are that have some sort of an edge, or for example, I like when I look at um, you know, if you, in this industry, there are a lot of people trying to sell dreams. They're selling software or a magic trading system or whatever it is. And what I've always kind of found to be true is, um, and not always, again, I'm not gonna lump everyone into one one pile here, but generally if somebody has found some sort of special sauce in the market, they're probably not looking to sell it. They're probably keeping it to themselves and, and just doing their own thing individually. And I'd say that generally applies uh, to most areas of this business. So if you, if you hear someone shouting about how much money they're making in the markets, uh, they might be talking about one week or one month, but not overall in general. Usually, you know, people tend to talk a lot more about the good things than they do the bad things. And so, unfortunately, you have to weed through a lot of um, misleading information and commentary and, and portrayals to get to the good stuff. Oh, there really is. And I think a lot of people, certainly people who are up seasoned like yourself, myself, I've been training for about 10 years. I think if you ask them the question that if you knew at the beginning how difficult trading was when you very started, it's very unlikely you would have probably entertained it as a long term career prospect. Right. <laughs> and that, I mean, would you say that for yourself? It's yeah, it, it is very, very difficult. And just when you think you've got it all figured out, the market, you know, uh, puts you back into reality. It is, it's a really, really tough game. Um, I've been doing this for a long, long time. And even, you know, it's an ongoing learning process. We are constantly tweaking and uh, revising things. Like, for example, um, if, you would have, if I would have talked to you a couple of years ago, I would have probably... Um, talked a lot about naked option selling and that sort of thing but i can honestly say uh we got beaten up a little bit earlier this year so we've absolutely adjusted our strategy and we probably will not ever have naked options anymore we generally we still like uh the strategy to be premium collection in general so for example we're always looking to collect more premium than we're paying out but we have started putting in catastrophic insurance just in case something ridiculous happens like we were caught in the s p fiasco in january uh oh, goodness. we were short calls on that crazy rally i mean i've never seen anything like that in my life but i always am reminded that just because you've never seen it and it's never happened doesn't mean it can't happen and so um so we've started playing it a little better as far as hedging and that sort of thing and i think going forward it'll, it'll be um it'll be a positive thing. But I mean, just the, that just goes to show you, I've been doing this for over, you know, well over a decade and I'm still tweaking and learning and changing with the markets. Unfortunately, the markets never stay the same. What worked last year, some, a lot of times doesn't work this year. And so it's really constantly a catch up game. And, that, and that's um, what you're kind of exemplifying is that what I, I would always refer to as the winning attitude. And that's uh, the ability to not be kind of infallible with your learning and have the kind of willingness to continue to learn more. I mean, I myself also appreciate the opportunity to learn more. I mean, I've got a good understanding of how markets work and am consistently profitable. But like you said, there's always something else. And I guess you can always right. blend things and synthesize them with your existing trading plan, huh? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, it's really just in my, this is my view and this is how I look at it. It's just a matter of being humble. And sometimes that, that's hard. If you get, go on a good run and everything goes your way, you start to feel a little overconfident and that's really where people get into trouble. And so uh, it's not, it's, it's not easy. In my opinion, it's 98% a mental game. I think the actual strategy and indicators you use and that sort of thing really honestly plays a very small part in whether or not you make or lose money. It really comes down to how you mentally handle the good times and the bad times and manage risk. Well, indicators sound great, don't they? Especially if you're talking shop. I mean, from my experience, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, retail traders, certainly take up retail trading because it sounds good. Um, they have no real right. interest in the tangible kind of reward at the end. They just like to tell their friends from an egotistical standpoint, hey, I'm, I'm going long on cable um, because of this. And it all sounds very good in right. the pub, huh? <laughs> it does. It does. Absolutely. Sure. And I, we get, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon. Yeah, that happens a lot. I mean, again, it, people like to talk about, um, throw words out there that maybe their friends might find impressive. And I made money on this trade, but they always leave out the, da the, the ugly side of things. And so we need to make sure everybody's aware of all the risks and what exactly they're getting into before they actually do it. 
So what, bearing this in mind, I mean, what originally attracted you to this high octane male dominated industry in the first place? Uh, honestly, just kind of dumb luck. I just stumbled into it. I, in college, I, my intention was to be a stockbroker. When I graduated, I did an internship and I just honestly didn't care for it. It was really, I found it to be more, um, like selling loaded mutual funds and, you know, charging fees for this fund rather than recommending an ETF, you know, that has very little fees associated. So I, it just, it wasn't for me. It wasn't very exciting and I didn't really feel, um, good about it. So I decided to, to go out and see what else was out there. And I, there just happened to be an office in town that did commodities. So I thought I'd give it a shot and I've loved it from day one. Well, fantastic. I know how it is. I saw in your uh, profile that used to be an introducing broker, i.e. a a fluffer um, in terms Mm -hmm. of like opening accounts for um, brokers. And I've had experience in doing that. And it can be quite soul destroying, especially when it's basically a sales role, whereas you compare that to actually entering the level playing field um, of financial markets trading where you can essentially make unlimited returns. If sure. You're right, that is. <laughs> well, yeah, right, if you're right. We are, I mean, that's still my bread and butter to, to this day is uh, the brokerage business, the brokerage side of business. And it is, you're right, it's largely a sales role. I found that um, I'm not a very good salesman, for, for starters. So, so instead of, like, hard selling, you know, in this industry, there's people that cold call or um, send pushy emails to everyone. We don't really do that at all. In fact, we kind of don't sell at all. All we do is put out what we believe to be high quality education and uh, marketing information and research and advice and that sort of thing. And then if people like what they see, they come to us. And I found that that's to be um, create far more long lasting relationships between us and our brokerage clients, because I mean, they're, you know, they've probably followed us for years before they actually picked up the phone and called us. So it's, it, it's worked out well. Um, but it's a tough game for sure. Well, that's very much a slow burn. And I think people appreciate this more and more because certainly here in Europe, um, I cannot uh, recall a day where I have not had a call from a broker trying to peddle oh. like an account. And it's all getting rather boring at the moment, yeah, <laughs> quite frankly. That's, that's, I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that people still answer their phone, honestly. I, don't. I get brokers that call me wanting me to open an account with them. And I, it's like, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I don't I don't even I've gotten to the point where I don't even answer the phone unless I know you know unless it's a business line of course but if I don't know who it is I'm not even answering the phone we'll see what happens you know it's not worth it well <laughs> there's some very sage words there I think I can certainly see why so why have you on that one <laughs> now I know your focus is on commodities and um, you really have had a lot of experience in trading oil um, in terms of your long or medium term view on silver and gold over the course of this and next year. Do you have one? Um, we actually, we did a pretty in-depth piece on gold about a, three weeks ago or so. We um, wrote some, wrote a commentary on it and for the street.com and a couple other outlets. And our, our basically our view is gold is probably, like if gold hasn't been able to rally in this environment where we're talking about trade wars, uh, nuclear wars. I mean, I know a lot of that's fizzled in the last week or two, but still, you go back a couple of months and those things were legitimate concerns and gold still could not break above like 1350, 1360 area. To me, that does not look um, positive, I should say, for, for gold. So I'm looking for, and also I do think even though the dollars had such a huge rip in the last month and it's a little overbought, I think it's probably going to continue overall. I mean, I think we'll probably get back in filling. But aside from that, I think the dollar has got some move, room to move on the upside. So I really am having a hard time seeing gold and silver do much on the upside at all. In fact, I'm looking for gold to print back into the 1100 handles. Um, I don't know if we'll see under 1100, but I think the 1120s are definitely possible. Okay, very interesting. And this is why they call it a market. I mean, we were preparing analysis <laughs> right. this morning because uh, we were thinking the exact opposite of gold. But I mean, we look at the market yep. for a slightly different way. And I do appreciate your yep. logic when it comes sure. to, okay, we're on the verge of nuclear war and gold still hasn't rallied. I mean, that is a, a huge red flag. And um, I appreciate you look at the fundamentals uh, in context, whereas we look at price mm-hmm. and they can sometimes tell very different stories. 
Um, Absolutely. Well, and people, the thing I found in, in this kind of stuff is maybe we're both right. We just have different time frames and things like that. Like my time frame is over the next um, two or three months. Yours might be more, you know, a little longer than that. So, and, and honestly, gold has been trading sideways for years. So who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe it's not going anywhere. Maybe it's just going to hang out here and do nothing. But, but you're right. Everybody has a different opinion and there's no uh, right or wrong. It's, it, you know, even if the market proves to to go lower, you're probably you might still be right in the long run. So it's, there's no judgment by any means, obviously. No, you're absolutely right, and we could be right. We could see a, a a rally in gold before it completely dumps, and this is why it always makes me laugh when I, on the rare occasion, I tune into um, CNN or Bloomberg and I see one uh, luminary talking up, say, the US dollar in the morning, an expert talking <laughs> down in the afternoon and in the evening. Everyone's right. confused and don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. it's Well, you know, and I try to, like, ex- anyone that I talk to, like our followers or whatever the case is, I try to explain to them, it's, we're all just making educated guesses. If we knew where the market was going, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on a beach somewhere like a you know an island that i owned sipping a margarita or something it's we're we're all using different tools and indicators and information and we you know we're doing what we think is right but ultimately nobody knows so. yeah nobody's right the whole time and that's yep, why they absolutely. call it a market <laughs> exactly exactly so the industry has changed quite a bit since you first came on board uh, with the decline of pit trading and the open outcry model to the proliferation of electronic trading um, do you think uh, pit trading will die completely i i do unfortunately and it, it's sad because i you know i had a lot of friends and colleagues that i worked with who were on the floor and spoke to on a daily basis and obviously that's just no longer the case anymore the the in the in u.s futures markets the New York pits are basically gone. There's, there are no pits trading in New York. In Chicago, it's dwindled down to basically uh, the big S&P, which honestly nobody trades anymore, sadly, uh, in a handful of option markets like the grains still get some open outcry volume from some of the bigger specs and funds and things like that. But honestly, I, my guess is within a year to year and a half, it's all going to be uh, history. So it's sad, but, you know, the yeah. industry has to change with technology. It is, as somebody that works with retail traders, as much as I hate to admit it, it you know the efficiency and the um, bill quality is far better on the electronic markets. So yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, we have seen the proliferation of. Um, new innovations in recent years of course uh, cryptocurrency which is this wonderful new asset class every tom dick and harry is talking about and even trading and we've even got right. social social copy trading which is uh, yeah. gaining in popularity i mean you, do you think that these two new um hot markets dare i say are merely a fad or do you think we'll see them increasing in their prominence uh you know it's crazy for as much talk as bitcoin gets it really doesn't see that much trading volume at least not in the futures markets like there's um you know a lot of chatter when the the cme and the ice exchange or i'm sorry not the ice the cboe issued the two bitcoin futures but if like i'm looking at the volume now um trading volume i mean it's spread between a handful of months but we're talking about like two or three hundred contracts traded today in most of the contracts. So, I mean, even if you accumulated all of them, I bet it's less than, far less than 10,000 contracts a day trading. And to put that into perspective, the E-mini S&P is trading like two, three, four million a day. So it's really just, there's just not a lot going on there other than chatter. Um, cash market obviously is different because there's dozens of marketplaces and people do it. But honestly, even then, I bet if you really drilled it down, I bet it's not nearly as active as in the in reality as it is um, in chatter. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And of course, um, rumors get emphasized, especially uh, the further from the market you get. I mean, there's all these stories, certainly from the Wall Street uh, crash, where the checkout clerk in the supermarket <laughs> basically told the broker, hey, I think I might buy General Electric. And of course, the broker went back, ran back to the office and sold all of his shares in General Electric. <laughs> there's no one left in the right. market if the checkout clerk is thinking of buying any on credit. That exactly. Is. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously it was... Uh, in December, when we were all looking at Bitcoin going ballistic on the upside, I think everybody that has been 
around trading, you know, for any amount of time knew that it couldn't end well, but nobody knew exactly where it wasn't going to end well. Was it going to be 18,000? Was it going to be 25,000? You know, it's hard to jump in front of a market like that. I have not touched Bitcoin and I have not recommended any of my clients touch Bitcoin mm. in either direction. I just don't. Um, for me, I just, there's just not enough of an edge that I can see. To me, it's more, it's a little more gambling. And I live in Las Vegas. I could go to the craps table anytime I want. So <laughs> there we go. Mark her words. <laughs> go down to William Hill or Labrooks. I mean, I share a similar view on cryptocurrency. I think that um, all that needs to happen is the G20 have a meeting uh, and basically say, hey, this thing um, threatens. Uh, central banks are financial system as we know it let's just put a block on it and i've been right. to various countries in the world where they effortlessly block websites or services which the government of that country deem unfit for public consumption and what's to stop sure. the democratic world the western world inverted commas dare i say from doing the same and they could easily right. do that from just one meeting and that's why i like you i'm very skeptical about investing any large sums of money in cryptos yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And it's really, I mean, it's really it, not super practical for the normal consumer. I, there are some um, retail outlets that accept Bitcoin, but the bid-ass spread between, like, if you're trying to actually pay with Bitcoin is so, is so outrageous. It, it's just not feasible at this time. That'll probably change at some point in the future. Maybe not Bitcoin, but some other cryptocurrency. Um, but again, you know, it just, not yet. It's too early. So we'll just have to let it play out and let everyone else have all the fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very much the Wild West. And we're seeing exactly. we're seeing these kind of like industries, these these kind of like exchanges, these brokerages pop up, which are essentially scams. And um, they're setting up and they're disappearing overnight. And it's incredible, these war stories, which I'm hearing from people. I know, it's unbelievable. And it, it's sad that people are getting sucked into that. But at the same time, people really, you can't just uh, jump on the bandwagon for the, you know, like that. You really have to do your research and know what you're getting into. You're absolutely right. Well, thank you so much, Kylie, for your time. Um, lastly, where, where can people find you if they want to find out more? I imagine a lot of people listening will want to find out more. So where can they okay. find you? So uh, the best place to find information about us and what we do is decarleytrading.com, and that's D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y trading.com. There's free information all over the place, articles, videos. So if you want to learn or if you're interested, you can go and learn everything you need to learn for free without ever... Um, trading or anything like that. And then if you decide to go forward, obviously we'd, we'd love to have your business. Uh, if you're on social media, my Twitter handle is at Carly Garner. I'm on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. We post commentary, charts, that sort of thing, and also dog pics. So we do put some personal stuff on there, but um, come find us. Dog pics. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. That's to CarlyTrading.com. Thank you very much once again, Carly. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it.